Okay, welcome everybody. So, this is a panel on leveraging cloud native for enterprises. I'm Cheryl Hung, I'm Director of Ecosystem at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So, if you'd like to start, you can introduce yourselves, what you do in the context of cloud native. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Brewer. I'm uh, the uh, chief architect of the small business and self-employed group at Intuit. Um, uh, this small business group is essentially QuickBooks. Um, and as the uh, chief architect, I uh, uh, set technology strategy, make technology decisions about um, the overall architecture of uh, QuickBooks um, and uh, all the associated um, properties with it, payments, payroll, whatnot, decide on uh, deployment technologies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, my name is Brad Topol. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer of Open Technology and Developer Advocacy. Um, I'm a Kube contributor, a member of the Kube Conformance Workgroup, and a Kube Doc maintainer. I also lead a large team that contributes upstream to Kubernetes, and I have responsibility for the content we create for containers and Kubernetes, tutorials, blogs, learning paths uh, for external developers. And hi, I'm Ken Owens. I work at uh, MasterCode. I lead the uh, Cloud Native Engineering team, which consists of um, all the app dev development teams, um, the tooling for the teams, uh, some of the infrastructure automation work that we have to do to kind of get ready for cloud, and I work with a lot of the platform engineering teams um, doing kind of the pivotal platform stuff as well. Great. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask a few questions to the group, and each of you can respond in turn. And hopefully we'll have some time for audience questions. There's a microphone here, so I'll run around and we'll get that for the video. So but first off, please, a round of applause to welcome everybody. Thank you, everybody, panel. Okay, so please can you share with us your journey towards cloud native and what you would say are the biggest things that you've learned in that? Should I, I should go first? Um, so, uh, so Intuit uh, has been on a, um, uh, a journey with our data centers for, for a long time. Uh, it's about a 35-year-old uh, company, but um, in the early 2000s, we really started getting into uh, SaaS businesses and, and online businesses. And um, at that time, uh, you know, it was some combination of you know running servers under our desks and uh, uh, and then also um, you know private data centers uh, and and uh, uh, mostly kind of cobbled together. And then um, uh, in you know mid 2000s, we decided to invest very heavily in building our own private data center. Um, and so we were a uh, private data center in Quincy, Washington, um, uh, uh, hosted system for the most part. And, um, and uh, we started to have uh, you know, some outages and whatnot, and Intuit isn't really, we even had outages before that, and Intuit isn't really, um, you know, the, the, uh, has that expertise to, to run and build a data center. Uh, and so at the time, uh, we reached out to AWS um, and started a big partnership with them uh, and mostly have um, uh, lifted and shifted, if I can use that term, um, a, lot of our, a lot of our services. Or mostly they're written in Java, so, um, so that wasn't like, incredibly difficult to do. But, um, uh, but we spent the last several years uh, moving to the public cloud, um, but going in mainly to EC2. And um, a, a couple years ago, we really started realizing that um, while AWS is fantastic, um, and they've been a fantastic partner, we really want developer experiences uh, and also a lot of the innovations that the community does um, that you're not getting from a single vendor. We're not so as much interested in a multi-cloud or any kind of journey like that, but we, what we really want is the developer experience that is provided by the community. And so um, our journey started with uh, we acquired a, uh, a company called Aplatix, um, which was a consulting company doing uh, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, uh, some super, super talented um, uh, engineers that were working in the Kubernetes space really understood it very, very well, understood how to do enterprise uh, projects, and uh, we immediately, um, after that acquisition closed, started uh, rolling out Kubernetes uh, as, a, um, as, a, as a deployment 
um, a, a orchestra container orchestration system at Intuit um, and started onboarding hundreds and hundreds of our services um, onto that platform. Um, we had to make it a, a little bit uh, Intuit. We have, um, for those of you who don't know, Intuit is a, a little bit like a bank, um, uh, not fully a bank, but uh, we have a lot of compliance needs. We also have a lot of um, uh, obviously, security is, is extremely, extremely important because we deal with financial data, um, both uh, on tax filings uh, and also uh, financial data for small businesses. And so, um, on top of that base Kubernetes, we started ad adopting technologies like Service Mesh uh, and uh, um, Open Policy Agent is something that's that's super, super important to us. So that's that's our uh, journey in a little bit of a long nutshell. <laughs> Bad, Ken. Sure. So IBM's journey is one that includes having uh, private cloud, public cloud, uh, hybrid cloud, and multi-cloud offerings. So providing a lot of flexibility. Uh, a lot of the lessons learned would come on the public cloud side. Uh, we have airline companies and car rental companies and weather.com that, that all run on our public cloud and lots of lessons learned. We migrated weather.com over in six months to run on our managed Kubernetes service. Um, that is, uh, and most of you see this and when you ever get your weather forecast, that's something that has 30 million users a day. It'll ramp up to 100 million users a day. It will have, when there's like a hurricane, and it has, it does one, kilo, one kilometer grid forecasts uh, every day, 250 billion of those a day. So what we learned is scale is huge and the ability that when a major storm hits to be able to rapidly scale up when, when, a, when a hurricane comes, it'll, the, the amount of data that it's processing and giving out to, the, to its stakeholders will increase like five times. Um, and then the other huge thing is security. Uh, from, from our enterprise customers, uh, image scanning, security, trust of what the images are doing, uh, and DevOps tools. There's no way we can do this and have those types of, of applications without providing a large amount of DevOps tools to, to make that possible. Great, Ken. So MasterCard has a, has a, is still on the journey, I would say. We're not quite arrived yet. Um, as you know, um, as a credit card company, you have a lot of uh, payment transaction processing network stuff, a lot of security, fraud detection, authorization. Uh, we uh, own certificate authority. We don't trust anyone else, right? So we have to, you know, there's a lot that you had to kind of design and build into that, that transaction network. And so a few years ago, we started acquiring, acquiring um, companies that were built in cloud. And the, the speed and agility was so much greater than what we could do in MasterCard that um, our president said, you know, we need to be like instant and perfect every time. And so I, I came over um, not too long after that and started working on, on the move towards um, cloud native, move towards uh, cloud services, which we played around in the cloud a little bit. We're not there yet. Um, mostly on-prem cloud is what we've been developing. And a lot of uh, legacy automation needed to like, just build infrastructure a lot quicker, a lot more efficiently, and a lot less error prone. Um, so I kind of started this whole journey uh, the lessons we've learned have a lot to do with just the people and the culture, having to really change the way people think about um, their jobs as, as engineers that are automating what they're doing, not just you know, technicians that can log into a device and make configuration changes to it. Um, a lot of the DevOps practices were not there, and so we've been kind of building this DevOps um, culture within the operations team, but also within the development teams. They, um, were writing their own pipelines, and each development team, even each application itself, depending on who the last app update was, the pipeline was completely different for each one of them. And so, just doing things like helping them understand what DevOps means, what a you know a, a CI capability process is, how to do blue green deployments, you know, these are things that they just had never thought of blue green deployments before. And so, we did a lot of I do a lot of education, a lot of you know, sitting down and pair programming next to them to help them understand how to do these things. And um, so, a lot of a lot of good lessons learned and a lot of progress made in um, turning things around. Within two years that I've been there, it's, it's gone from where well, I thought we'd never make the turn to actually we're accelerating what we've been doing. So it's it's been good. Great, thank you. And 
if you're if you're talking to an enterprise CTO, what approach would you use to persuade them that they can modern, modernize their applications with cloud native technologies? Just just for me. So it, it it's a really great question and what we like to do is show them what the art of the possible is when you start embracing the capabilities of something like Kubernetes and the declarative model. So for example, we can start by showing how there's these Docker files that you can always, as a DevOps model, you can always be generating your, do your Docker files. And so you can store them in your source code repository. And you can also have all the YAML for Kubernetes, everything's in YAML. So you have all this stuff that's now declarative. And so, you know, previous cloud infrastructures, you would use a, something like a chef or puppet. Nobody knows exactly what's happening. Here you can talk about these, this is describing exactly what you're going to deploy. Everybody can see it. If anybody makes a change, it's going to be in GitHub. It's, it's in, you know, the, you, you can see the changes that were made. And so you start there and then you show the power of being able to deploy uh, cloud native applications. And obviously that, oh, you can have mul multiple replicas. You can do lots of deployments. And so it's easy to do upgrades. It's easy to scale up. All of that's really good, and you show them with sort of the new application, and they think, well, that's great, but all my stuff is this legacy enterprise middleware. And then that's where we like to come in and say, well, you know, we have all that legacy enterprise middleware already made available as containers, and we already have uh, Helm charts, which is uh, the Kubernetes templating model for, for those YAMLs to, to deploy. So now I'm not focused on the new stuff that you weren't quite as excited about. Let me show you all this middleware, whether it's a DB2, an MQ, um, uh, something with Kafka, all of this available for you, and now you can get this up and running in minutes as opposed to weeks. And when you take them on that journey and then you get to the point where it's all about that enterprise middleware, that's when it clicks that, hey, I really can make this work. Can I? Yeah. answer that a little bit as well because I went through a little similar thing with our CTO, although I cheated because um, our CTO is the uh, former head of product development at Docker. And so <laughs> the, the convincing on the yeah. containers and the Kubernetes wasn't so hard. It, but it was more about like the, the engineering community and that very similar thing as it's about the developer experience. And that was the, the big difference between um, the, the raw AWS uh, experience um, and the cloud native experience is uh, we've really found that the innovations in the community um, have uh, um, really resonate with the developers, and it, it speaks for itself a lot when you see teams onboarding onto uh, onboarding their service onto Kubernetes, and they're like, "Wow, this is I can understand this. This is this is you know the the, the declaration, the separation of concerns. It, it all makes a lot of, a lot of sense." And so um, th that is a uh, argument that also works uh, very well for 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 the CTOs and the senior leadership staff. Just, just to add um, one last thing to this, the, in, a, in a company that has you know, a global presence, this 24-7 can never go down, right? Your, your CTO really doesn't care if their application teams are happy or not, right? They, <laughs> they want to deliver the service, they want the service to be reliable, they don't want it to ever go down. And so if, if you're in that type of an, of a, an environment where you, you really can't just say, look, this is a better way to do it, because it, it's obvious it's a better way, right? And the CTO isn't dumb. He knows it's a better way to do things, right? He just knows that he gets rated on how many transactions we're processing 24-7, 365, never going down, right? Um, and so in that situation, I think what, what, what I used was the, the outage and the issues. When there was an issue, when there was an outage, most of them were caused by human errors. Or by, by, to your point, if you're looking at code in, in Git, you can see if somebody made an error and you can correct it. Oh, and by the way, if you tested that in the dev environment first, instead of just going straight to prod with this emergency change, you would have found it in dev, right? So just helping them see that it's not just because it's better, but it's because it actually improves your security, improves your reliability, and it improves everything that you care about. Then they really understand why they want to make this change versus it's just better. The mean time to recovery aspect is huge. It's just it was a it was a even another leap, um, you know, over over EC2 um, going to Kubernetes. So that that that's definitely very compelling. 
So for an enterprise CTO, there's three areas that they need to consider when moving from traditional IT towards cloud native. So the first is the architectural decisions, the architectural design. Second is the impact that it will have on application developers and platform developers. And the third is the impact it will have on operations. So let's start with the architectural design. So what are the considerations that a CTO should make when deciding whether or not to incorporate cloud native, for example, by private cloud, public cloud, or hybrid approach, and the pros and cons? I'll start this one. So I think the, the first consideration I would bring up is um, what we've gone through at MasterCard is helping making sure that the legacy infrastructure is moving towards the new cloud native infrastructure. Um, app teams want to get kind of tied up in do I deploy to the legacy or do I deploy to the new? And we don't want them to even think about whether it's a legacy or new. Just write your code, test the code, deploy the code, and where it lands, you don't need to worry about that, right? And so that's kind of what we started was the let's make sure the platform becomes a platform and it's not a bunch of disparate systems that the app teams have to try to figure out how do I use them. It's they write their code, deploy it, and it doesn't have to matter where it's at. I think just adding on um, one more thing to that, really on the architectural consideration, um, is about the, the deployment process, right? Having a lot of integrity um, in the deployment process from, um, uh, you know, whether you're in public or private cloud, it's, it's really about, you, you, the, the, the thing that we've found um, uh, the best uh, mechanism for that is really is doing something called GitOps, where, you're, where Git is really the source of truth um, for, your, um, for both your deployment, um, uh, deployment description and your code. And so it's really clear from, um, you know, from the source code system what should actually be um, deployed um, into your system. Um, so what we look at is, uh, from an architectural perspective, we're going to really emphasize flexibility. You know, you make sure you have things such that you can run stuff on-prem if it needs to run on-prem. You have stuff that if you choose to run on one or multiple public clouds, that it can run on one or multiple public clouds. So um, being able to support all of that and a hybrid cloud is, is very important. Um, also, as part of the architecture, you're probably going to have to have a discussion. It always comes down to security. So they're probably going to have a security team, and the security team is going to have lots of concerns. And being able to look at, like how in Kubernetes, uh, a lot of the security is, is done with declarative policies, just like everything else, you can sort of hopefully bring that security team out of the stone age and say, look, you, you, you can have buy-in. You can help define the policies. You can see everything. This shouldn't make you nervous. Let's feel comfortable moving forward with the, these new technologies. And make sure you get them to document that they approve things, because they forget <laughs> often. Classic enterprise. <laughs> OK. What was the second part? So, um, the second part was the, the sort of pros and cons of public, private, cloud, hybrid? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it, depending on the customer, sometimes the, 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 you know, the most focus is going to be on the on-prem. And for other folks, they're, they're willing to uh, be more aggressive and move to the public cloud. It's, it's kind of just a feel based on the industry, um, based on, you know, are they willing to move to the to the to the managed service because the, the 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 wonderful thing you can say is listen if you're willing to go try the public cloud you get to start tomorrow right if you're gonna you're not quite comfortable yet well and you want to do our on-prem stuff it, it might take a few months before you get up and rolling so they have to to make that trade-off of well do I want to start tomorrow which would really be great are there things I really could do and, and move and, and that's what they're going to have to look at uh, those kinds of decisions. That's going to add on, on, on there, you know, from the Intuit perspective, um, I think one of the hurdles that, that we have, we, we really prefer the public cloud overall, just, um, uh, you know, learning from 
uh, not being able to manage our own data centers. We had a, a, a pickup truck drive into a light pole in San Diego and it took down one of our data centers, right? And so, um, and, and so with that consideration, the, the, really the barriers were around, a lot of it was around compliance. And so that's a, that can be a really key consideration. Do you have things like HIPAA? Um, and and or or NIST or some some things where there isn't necessarily um, and maybe this is true a little bit more a couple a few years ago um, in the public cloud where you wouldn't be able to get those certifications there but um, but uh, you know as that's all progressed um, GDPR all that stuff um, uh, that you can now do these certifications in 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 the public cloud and so there's there you know there may be some. Um, you know, some, some very uh, specialized needs where you need to do private cloud, but the, uh, the public cloud is, is it's, it's so ubiquitous and so valuable now, it, it just seems like a no-brainer. So I can, I can tell you from um, a lot of experience that your application teams, and if you're app developers, sorry to say this, but you, you have to write your application in a way that you can turn it off. Because if you just take your app that you run 24-7 on-prem, and you throw it up into a cloud and run it 24-7, you're going to spend five times more for the cost of that service than you did on-prem. Right? Cloud is cheaper when you turn things off and turn things on when you need them. And so mm -hmm. um, that's one big lesson that, that we've learned um, with app teams that have budgeted small numbers and have come back with 100 times what they budgeted for and asked for forgiveness for, <laughs> for their spend. Um, <laughs> The, the, other, the other important lesson there is um, from a security standpoint, you, you only need to understand the security posture you're moving towards, it, as was brought up. And, um, and, and in MasterCard's case, we have contracts with a lot of banks and a lot of other third party issuers and other you know, merchants out there. And so um, each of those contracts was signed back in the Stone Age where you know, internet was, a f everybody's afraid of it, so they put it in their closets, do not ever run this in the internet or run this in the cloud. Or, <laughs> whatever, right? And so, so we've had to go back and kind of make sure that, because we're pretty sure, at least I'm pretty sure, that these companies would be okay now, because most of them are in the cloud. But anyway, you have to go back and kind of make sure that you're not violating any contracts. And then the last one kind of ties into operations a small amount, so I won't spend too much time on it. But it has like, it's kind of a double-edged sword with operating in the cloud, because you're, to the point you mentioned with managed services, it's somebody else's headache, right? Um, when you are making a billion dollars a minute and something goes down in the cloud and your CEO comes down to you and says, hey, why are we down? And you say, I don't let me call AWS. Good luck, <laughs> right? It does, there's, you got to kind of know, like you, you don't have that person you can go talk to and say, hey, my, my networking isn't working right. Can you look at it, right? They, they don't have access to look at it. And so, so companies like MasterCard that have what I like to call these heroes everywhere, right? That are guys that when there's a problem, and they open up a phone bridge and people jump on and these heroes get on and log into different routers and they trace route things down and they find the problem and they fix it right away. You don't get that in the cloud. You, you have to kind of trust that your development teams wrote their applications to be turned off, to be ephemeral, mm -hmm. to lose state and be able to come back up and recover on their own, that they were designed for failure, which a lot of app teams, again, hmm. don't have that muscle built very well yet. But if, if it's done right, I think it's the best place to run your applications, but you have, to, you have to do it right. That's actually a good introduction into my next question, which is that sometimes there's tension between business application developers versus platform developers. So what advice would you give to ensure that these two groups can work together well? I'm going to give a short answer. Strong DevOps tools and, and good integration tools to help give a, a seamless feel for that. Yeah, that was definitely what I was going to say, too. It, the, the easier you make the integration between the two, the better. The API first kind of design. Um, if you don't go down that path, you're just, and I've seen this in other companies, you, you have a lot of tension between the two groups because one's relying on the other one to do something, and that's not a good place to be in. Yeah, we, we still have a, a, a few amount of monolithic code bases where the platform and the application is, is a, a little bit merged together. But, um, but you know, I'd echo of those things. I'd, I'd also add um, is that the, um, 
you know, the, the, the API and that layer, that, that, think of that as a, as a product. Um, and think of that as, that is the interface, you know, really between the applications and the more back end of the platform. And uh, uh, it, it, it needs to be well documented, clear, clear contracts. Um, it's, it's, that's yeah. super, super important. So do you think that enterprises IT, enterprise IT is ready for service meshes and for serverless? Go on first. Well, I, so I mean, from a, yeah, I can go from an, an Intuit perspective, um, uh, we're ready for both. Um, and uh, we've, uh, um, we've really started rolling out a, a, a services mesh. Um, and it's interesting, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, um, a lot of people, you know, it's it's complicated, right? It's 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 not um, like rolling out something like Istio is not for the, uh, you know, not for the the newbie, right? Um, and uh, uh, but we see those we see uh, those benefits. We're always after those those benefits of 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 you know ubiquitous mesh where you can get telemetry, you can get tracing, you can get all that kind of stuff for free, right? And so that's what makes us ready for it is we feel like we're kind of blind op operating our applications right now and that, that lets us see and, and, and introspect into them. Um, on the serverless front, uh, you know, it's obvious, you know, for, um, for a lot of the uh, developers, they, you know, especially if you're developing something new, it's a lot easier to think about uh, breaking down your problem into functions that run, um, you know, very, very stateless. Uh, and so a lot of our new stuff um, will just go out on, on serverless or functions as a service infrastructure. And so we're, we're, we're trying to press really hard on rolling that out inside the same Kubernetes clusters because one of the things that's really important is that both the serverless and the service mesh interoperate together. And so you want to make sure that developers aren't doing something completely different um, in, in, the, in, a, in their serverless code as they would be doing in their code that's deployed to containers? So, uh, you know, my short answer is going to be yes. Um, we have a service mesh Istio available as a beta. We also have serverless in the form of Knative uh, available on our public cloud as experimental. Um, and the interesting thing about it, you know, when you take something like Kubernetes and Istio and Knative, you, you know, what we're starting to see, and this is for some of the folks like myself who've been around for a while, we're starting to see these types of things come together and actually provide you a unified platform. So the analogy I like to use is way back when, I, I know this guy remembers, as, uh, you know, remember J2EE, right? Well, it was the, the application platform and you worried about just building your app, right? And then the, 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 whether it was uh, WebSphere or what have you, provided you so much functionality. What we're expecting to see and what we're seeing is between the Kubernetes, the Knative, and the Istio, um, you got to use certain things for the right things. Obviously, uh, the serverless doesn't work for everything. But again, getting to that happy place of where the developer just works on their small piece and the platform provides a lot of what they need. And it works really well until they invented EJBs. <laughs> Let's not go there. So I was going to say, I was going to like try to like cause a little bit of like, you know, um, dissension and say no, but I think I'll say it depends as I thought about it more because if you're a, a large enterprise, you're not, we're not ready for it because of the, the network, the security aspects of it, right? There's a lot, you know, like, like our standard is MTLS, but we have our own certificates, right? And, and Istio still doesn't do a great job of giving you a way to maintain and manage your own certificate store, right? And so they're working on it. I know we're, we're working with them, but um, they're not quite to the point that our security team feels secure. And, and then you guys, if you use your credit card, I'm hoping you agree with that. You don't want us just <laughs> trying out new things just because we can. Um, and so, so what we're looking at it, it's kind of, you know, we're, we're testing it out. Same thing with serverless, we have um, some very early experimental testing going on with serverless stuff. And we do have a lot of use cases. Um, there's some things we, we feel like are really interesting with our core um, product line that um, we're looking at kind of the next generation of our switch architecture. And the switch architecture is the core of that transaction processing network. And so um, we've done a little bit of ex, you know, experimentation with serverless out at the merchant and out in the cloud so that the credit card processing happening is out at the edge, as close to the merchant as it can, which is kind of cool. But again, we won't be doing any 
any changes there until we have it all rock solid. But that, that there's definitely interested, interest in looking at it. And that kind of brings, the, the, the big point I wanted to make was that in this environment, things are changing so quickly that you almost have to have this continuous model of looking at new technologies and, and playing with it. Because at least at MasterCard's case, it took me um, probably six to nine months to get the security team to sign off on service mesh and then what it could do for us, right? And just to look at it, just experimental looking at it, right? Um, and it's going to take showing them and having them do all kinds of tests against it for another probably six to nine months before they'd say, yeah, you can put this in the stage environment and have app teams test on it, right? And mm -hmm. so it's, if you get the technology in sooner, then you, you give your other operational teams a chance to kind of look at it and make sure that they buy into it, which takes time for some companies. And that's why I said maybe. For MasterCard, it's a no. For other enterprises, it's probably a yes, because they can move faster and, and go quicker. But we're still kind of at that we're investigating it phase. Yeah, I'd revise my answer a little bit more to maybe because there are certain places at Intuit right, where we're dealing with payments and, mm -hmm. and financial trans very sensitive data, and we're a little bit less apt to just yeah. experiment with those things in those areas. So. so we've got about five minutes left. So I'd like to ask, what do you think the cloud native community should do or should focus on in order to ensure that cloud native is ready for enterprise IT? I can start with that one. So I think um, the first one is to give um, feedback. We have an end user group, a community within the, in the CNCF. Um, and it'd be great to get feedback from, from the users uh, to us in terms of what you need, right? And there are things like, like Jeff represents us at the TOC. So we have representation at the TOC. Um, and it, it's really important that we hear from you what, what challenges you're having, what we could do to help make it easier to get adoption in the enterprise space. And so I just open it up as, just, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I forgot to mention earlier that I'm the end user representative on the technical oversight committee. And um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, that's the, there's something called a trail map I think you guys um, might have heard of. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the biggest things I think that the, that the Kubernetes community or the, the, the overall CNCF community can do here is, is provide some of those guideposts and examples um, for what to use, right? It's a, it's a bit of a paradox of choice out there, right? Um, uh, there's like over 30 projects, um, uh, you know, in the different phases of graduated incubation and whatnot. And, um, and it's a little bit difficult sometimes, like, and there's open source projects outside of the CNCF official projects. And how do you figure out, you know, what you should use to piece together? Should I install Jaeger? Should I, you know, you just don't know, right? Um, and, uh, and so um, with this large uh, end user community um, that's growing, I think it's over 80, uh, 80 members, I think you can find a buddy now. You can find another company like you um, and maybe but that usually helps on, on that journey. And so maybe um, that's one thing, you know, is, is pre lean, really leaning in on that community. That's one of the powers of the community is you can find someone else like you um, and learn from them and they can learn from you. So I, I mean, part of it is sort of keep doing what we're doing. Uh, the community, from what I can see, does an outstanding job of reaching out and trying to grow the community with office hours, with mentoring, feedback sessions. And so the one thing I would like to point out for enterprise companies, and some of them are starting to see this, and there's some of the, the literature out there is pointing to it. It's one thing to, to just consume open source as an enterprise, but what they're seeing is if they let their folks actually join in the community and contribute upstream to the open source, the benefits are actually much greater. There's something that happens as you let your people go mingle in with the community and then think of all the people that they learn from all that they learn from and all that they're, the new tools, you know, whenever you write code in an upstream community, you, you write it and then 20 people smarter than you show you 20 better ways to do what you're doing. So the amount of knowledge that comes back to your enterprise by allowing your folks to actually contribute to the open source community is huge. And I just say, you know, let's, let's keep pushing on that. Fantastic, so we've got one minute left. So we may have, maybe have time for one question, if anyone has a question. Yeah. 
Great panel. Um, Jeff, I think you mentioned uh, you were primarily a Java shop or you had you know, a lot of your critical applications in Java. Can you speak to your uh, experience? Java isn't thought of, enterprise Java isn't thought of as being cloud native. Your experience migrating those apps to the cloud? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it has been a little tricky, right? Like, we, we noticed that um, uh, languages like Node, Go, um, Ross, these, these ones, they operate better, um, uh, you know, in the cloud native. And I think the, the very specific problems are about the way Java manages its memory. It usually likes to take a big chunk and then it does all this garbage collection inside. Um, you know, just from, from uh, um, oh, well, and also the, the open source aspect of all of us are aware of what's going on with Oracle and the JDK. And so we, we've, we've decided to um, move towards something like Coretto. But um, Red Hat actually has has a really interesting thing, and this isn't something that I've learned yet, but I want to learn, um, is, a, is a more uh, cloud-native um, uh, uh, Java container that's not just a JDK installed on an operating system, right? They'll actually more natively run their code, and I, you know, I don't know all the deep specifics about it, but it sounds like it can manage that memory a lot better, um, and also has much more optimized startup time. Those are the two things where we run into a lot of problems with Java, so. Jeff, Brad, Ken, thank you so much for giving your thoughts and opinions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, everyone.